Okay, thank you. Well, it's so good to be back again this morning and to see some uh, faces from last night and some, some old friends from uh, a while ago. Uh, I, we, we were going to continue our study of 1 John this morning, and there are a couple of texts that I want to read to prepare us for this, but I also uh, need to, I can't leave here without passing along greetings. There were a couple of folks in particular who knew that I was going to be traveling here and who wanted to pass along greetings to you. Dr. Pipo is one of those. Uh, you know him well from previous years, and he speaks so highly of all of you and, uh, and, and wanted me to, to pass that along in a formal way. And then the other was uh, someone whom I spoke with as I was driving up, but he's a good friend whom I speak with on a fairly regular basis, uh, Peter Van Duduard, and I understand he knows some of the folks in the congregation here, and so he wanted to pass along his greetings as well. So I need to discharge those duties so that I can go back with a clear conscience, and uh, so I do pass along their, their greetings and affection uh, for you. As well, um, there are others at the seminary who may not have formally asked me to do that, but, but as I mentioned last night, they really do uh, speak highly of, of all of you and the seminary uh, community really um, this, this church is very dear to the seminary community, so, so thank you for your encouragement uh, over the years. Well, let's turn to 1 John chapter 1. I'll read beginning in verse 5 and then going through chapter 2, verse 6. I won't, I won't even break at the chapter break. And then, and then um, we, will, we will go, we will skip down, and I will uh, remind you of this when, when we get there, uh, to verse 29, and then I'll read from 229 through 310. So 1, 5 to 2, 6, 229 to 310. Remember as I read, as you hear and follow along and, and listen, this is, this is God's word. This is inspired, breathed out by God, inerrant, infallible. It's our only guide for life and practice. So uh, let's read uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 6 to begin. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Then moving down to... Uh, verse 29 of that same chapter, and then going through 3.10. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one ab who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, 
for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We need this kind of clarity and instruction, and you've given it to us graciously. We thank you for that. We pray that as we study your word, you would give us open ears and attentive hearts. We, we know that your spirit works through your word. This is called the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And so we pray that your spirit would, would wield his sword in our midst, convicting us of sin and, and training us in righteousness and pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the undeniable problems that we see in the church today, and it's not a new problem, by the way, it's a problem that we see in every era of church history, and not least in the early church to which John is writing, but in, in virtually every era, one of the, one of the problems that besets the church, one of the difficulties that besets the church, is, is worldliness and unrighteousness. Now, now, sometimes we resist these kinds of terms in our day and age, because perhaps some of you have been exposed to Christian teaching that talked about worldliness, but identified worldliness in, in ways that went beyond what the Bible says. And so we, we have all kinds of Christian teachers or so-called Christian teachers who, who define worldliness in terms of certain behaviors that are sort of cultural manifestations and aren't found in the New Testament, and they can move into a kind of legalism. And so in order to avoid that, in order to avoid that danger, uh, we sometimes swing the other direction and don't talk about worldliness and unrighteousness at all. Uh, and, and yet the Bible talks about it frequently, and particularly in this uh, section of Scripture. Well, one, of the, one of the sad things today is that when, when surveys are taken about attitudes towards certain moral behaviors, uh, one, of the, one of the sad facts is that very often self-identified evangelical Christians ha have the same attitudes and the same practices as, as the world at large, as people who make no claim to know God or, or to follow His Word. And that's a, that's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that I think John would say exposes uh, the fact that many who say they know God actually don't know Him at all. Uh, many who say that they have fellowship with God, you know this, how this expresses them itself, uh, you'll meet someone and they'll say, you know, I'm fine, God and I are fine, that kind of thing, that kind of casual attitude toward a relationship with God. Many people who say that, John would say, actually don't know anything about God and don't have any real fellowship with Him. So this is the first test that John gives. Remember from last night, the reason why John is giving these tests, of which this is the first, is to reassure those who are believers, those who are genuine believers, and to give them confidence in their faith. And that confidence needs to be rooted in an understanding and, and, and a confidence in the reality of the truths that we confess. So you have to actually uh, reaffirm your, your, your trust in those truths that, yes, this is real. Yes, this is reliable. Yes, what we've been taught is true. Then there's another sort of level to that confidence, which is that we also are going to be reassured through these tests, John says, that we ourselves are, are possessors of eternal life, that we ourselves are actually those who are in fellowship with God. We ourselves have the hope of eternal life promised in Jesus Christ. So it's that, it's that confidence, that confidence in the, the truths of Christianity and that confidence in our standing in Christ that John is seeking to bolster through this test. And, and the first test, as I said, is this test of righteousness, uh, this test of holiness. I call it the test of righteousness because John uses that word righteous over and over again. Maybe you heard it as I read through these passages. Unrighteousness and righteousness are repeated 
uh, over and over again in this section. So I want to look at these two sections individually, beginning in chapter 1, verse 5. John begins, and he's going to begin both sections in this way. He begins this section with something that is true about God, with a truth about God and about God's nature. Now, the truth about God that starts off this test, that this whole test is premised upon, you might say this is the foundation, and then the test is built on top of the foundation. The foundation, the premise is this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, this is something that is very difficult for us to imagine. We can almost imagine the opposite of this, but it's hard for us to imagine what, what John uh, says here. We can almost imagine being in a situation of total darkness. Maybe you've been in situations like this. Uh, several years ago, my family and I took a trip. We have some relatives in Northern Ireland. We went there uh, to, to visit them and also to do some, some sightseeing and things like that. And, and one, of the, one of the sites that we went to was this ancient uh, stone, uh, uh, really this ancient sort of pile of stones. They're not sure exactly what it is, but you can sort of walk into it. It takes you into the earth. And, and at a certain day of the year, the light comes through, which makes them think it might have been some ancient ritual destination. Older than the pyramids, 500 years older than the pyramids. And you go down into, these, into this construction, and, and you're in the, the darkest point. And, and what the tour guides will do at that point is they'll, they'll flip off the lights. I had a similar experience once going down in a coal mine, on a coal mining tour. And, and, and at a certain point, the, the, the guide flips off the lights, and, and, and there's no light at all. You can't see the hand in front of your face. And what happens in those situations is even the smallest light, even a, 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 a lighter or, or a match, really lights the whole place up. So we can imagine those kinds of situations. We can imagine a situation of utter darkness, which light pierces, but it's hard for us to imagine this, which is utter light in which there is no darkness at all. This is one of these unfathomable mysteries of who God is. We, we can declare it. We can confess it. We must confess it. But we can't quite wrap our heads around it. This is why the psalmist says his greatness is unsearchable. I don't think any of us really understand what it means to say God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And yet, that's the premise, that's the foundation for this whole test. Now remember, Jesus says this, Jesus says words very similar to this, recorded for us in John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And remember, John begins his gospel by talking about the fact that the world was in darkness until Jesus came as the light of the world. So we have similar language that, that John uses here about God being light and in God there being no darkness at all. And of course, what he's talking about here isn't just uh, the, the visual apprehension of God that there is no actual darkness in him, although that, that, that's true, uh, but, but what he's actually going to say is, because there is no darkness in him at all, uh, that, that, that's, that's a moral statement as well. It's not just a visual statement. It's not just about God's appearance being all light. It's actually about the fact that, that God has no sin. He is without sin in every respect. He is without any holiness, without any imperfection. In fact, God is perfect in his being and essence. God is, God is uh, totally without any of the flaws or failures that, that, that govern our lives in so many ways. Now again, as I said, we, we can hardly begin to wrap our minds around that. Because everything we experience as created beings, and, and especially everything we experience as created fallen beings, it, it involves some kind of sin and flaw. Sin has infected, we know, every part of our lives. That's what we mean when we talk about 
total depravity. We mean that, we mean that there's, there's no part of us that is sort of pristine and untouched by sin. Every part of us has, has in some way been affected by sin in our, in our fallen state. And even the created world, as we see it in Genesis 1, before the fall, has light. Yes, of course, God creates light, we see on, on day one, but, but also darkness. And so even in a world without sin, it, we wouldn't say there is no darkness at all. There is even that visual darkness in the created world. And yet God, John tells us, has no darkness at all. God is pure light. Now, what does that mean then for us? What implications should that have for us? Well, he's going to now build on this to give us the, the test. The test it begins then in verse 6. If, if we then, as human beings, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yes, I know God, yes, I, I, I am united to, to Christ. Yes, I am reconciled to God. All of these wonderful uh, words that we get to describe our salvation. I was, I was once an enemy, but now I'm a friend of God. If we claim that for ourselves, and yet we ourselves walk in darkness, then what we are displaying is that we, we don't have that fellowship with God that we have claimed. It's a very simple premise, really. If God is light, and if we claim to know God and have fellowship with God, we have close communion with God, and yet we're walking in darkness, well, there's something incompatible about that. There's something about that that just doesn't fit, John says. Now, he's going to explain this a little bit further because one question that might arise immediately in your minds, in fact, I hope it does arise in your minds when you hear that, is you say, well, then, well, then what... What is that saying about any of us? Because, because all of us, while we might make a claim to have fellowship with God, all of us are still, uh, are still sinners. Uh, we still regularly break the, the law of God. And, and, and I hope that, that on every Lord's Day in the morning when you gather together for worship, you actually confess this before the Lord. You say, Lord, we're, we're coming to you. Uh, and, we, and we love you, but, but we're coming to you as sinners. And we're coming in need of your cleansing and in need of your grace uh, constantly. And so how does that fit with what John says in verse 6, that if we walk in darkness, uh, we lie and do not practice the truth if we're also saying we have fellowship with God? Well, John's going to explain what he means here by walking in darkness and walking in the light. And what he's going to say is it doesn't mean that we have no sin. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, John says, if anyone claims to not have sin, they're lying and they actually don't know God at all. Think about these accounts we have in the Old Testament about individuals, very few accounts, but they're, they're, they're poignant, they're powerful, about individuals who, who actually have a, a vision uh, of God and, and some aspect, some, some partial aspect of God's glory and majesty is revealed to them. We know that God, no one can see God in, in his fullest glory and live. But remember these incidents where, where people have these kinds of encounters. The one that comes to mind, I think, most readily to me is in Isaiah chapter 6. Do you remember what happens in Isaiah 6 when Isaiah is brought into the, the presence of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and, and, and the Lord is seated on his throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple. And, and what happens to Isaiah when he has this, this vision of the Lord seated? Well, Isaiah doesn't say, I have fellowship with you, and I'm sinless. No, what does Isaiah say? Isaiah says, woe is me. I am, I am ruined. I'm undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, what it actually means, John's going to tell us, to walk in the light is not to be without sin. And in fact, if someone were to claim to be without sin, that would actually be a sign that they don't have sin 
any real knowledge of God at all. Look at what he says in verse um, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Have you ever noticed how the Apostle Paul refers to himself and describes his own spiritual experience and spiritual attainments? It's an interesting study if you look through the New Testament and you, and you sort of map out how Paul describes himself. Most of the time, Paul describes himself as an apostle and a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the most common ways in which Paul refers to himself, and rightly so. He needed to assert that apostolic authority, and he's always conscious of the fact that he is in service to Christ in every particular. But have you ever noticed that as the Apostle Paul uh, refers to himself in those ways, apostle, slave of Christ, he also says uh, things like this. He, he, he begins by talking about himself as the least of the apostles. But if you look at the latest Pauline letter, the Pauline letter that was written closest to his death, you know how Paul refers to himself? He refers to himself as the chief of sinners. Now, why is that? Was Paul becoming uh, more and more sinful? Was he wrapped up? in more and more sinful behavior? No. In fact, Paul, we know, was, was being sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it's the Apostle Paul who gives us probably our clearest teaching on the doctrine of sanctification, the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work in believers to transform us into the image of Christ. Paul knew that. Paul had experienced that. But why is it that Paul, when he comes to the end of his life, having experienced that, and having experienced this sanctifying work of the Spirit, and actually writing from prison where he was suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, he calls himself the chief of sinners. Well, I think that tells us something. It tells us that very often, as we move closer and closer to the Lord, as we are drawn to Him, as the Holy Spirit works transforming us, yes, we are being transformed more and more into the image of Christ. Yes, we are by His grace, being made more holy and more righteous. And yet, as we're drawn closer to God, we have a greater sense, perhaps, of that experience that Isaiah wrote about. We have a greater sense that as we draw closer to the Lord, we see ourselves in contrast to Him. We see our own unholiness and unrighteousness and our sins are exposed. And perhaps you've experienced this if you've been a Christian for some time. Early on in your Christian life, you thought, well, if there, there are these one or two things, if I could sort of work through these one or two things, if the Lord could rescue me from these one or two besetting sins, then, then, then I would essentially be perfectly holy. And then what happens? Well, as the Lord uh, grows you in Him, you realize that by His grace, you have changed. And you're not the same person you were five years ago. And praise God for that. But you're, you're actually now more aware of other things uh, on which you need to work and, and, and on which you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit. And that, that's the way it is in the Christian life. And, and John, see, that's how John actually defines what it means to be growing in righteousness. He doesn't define it as sinless perfection. He says God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Therefore, we can't be simply walking in darkness, walking in unrighteousness. But, but on the other hand, I don't mean to say that therefore we have to be without sin. Because, in fact, if someone claimed to be without sin, they're lying to you, first of all. And they don't really understand the first thing about who God is as this one who is without any darkness at all. So how is it that we're supposed to walk? in terms of our sin. Can't claim we have no sin, and yet we're not to walk in unrighteousness or walk in darkness. So what does it look like to, to walk uh, not in darkness, but yet to recognize our own sinfulness? Well, what John says in verse 9 is this, that the way this works is that we are sinners, and we're probably becoming increasingly aware of our sinfulness if we're being drawn closer and closer to God. That's only natural. But what we need to do then in that case is we need to confess our sins before the Lord. You see, as we're made more aware of our sins, it's incumbent upon us to confess these things to the Lord. 
to ask for his help, to ask for his forgiveness, to ask for further growth, to put to death those deeds of the flesh, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. You remember Paul when he describes himself in Romans 7, he describes that struggle that takes place within him. I, I, I know the things that I, I want to do aren't the things that I do, and the things that I don't want to do are the things that I find myself doing. And so Paul tells us to put to death these things, and, and John tells us to confess these things to the Lord. And the promise, of course, is that in confessing these things to the Lord, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of all these sins. And, and, and the reason for that, the way in which he does that, you might say, from a judicial perspective, the reason why God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins is because... We have this advocate, Jesus Christ. And so you, you might think of this in judicial terms. As you confess your sins to the Lord, the Lord is faithful to forgive those sins, but He's also just to forgive those sins. Well, how is that? How is God being just when He forgives these sins that you confess to Him? Well, He's being just because Jesus Christ is serving as your advocate. Remember what the book of Hebrews tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He ever lives to intercede on our behalf. That's what it means to live in the light, to walk in the light. One of the aspects of walking in the light is relying on this advocating ministry of Jesus, this intercessory ministry of Jesus. And not only is he our intercessor making an argument for us, as it were, before the Father, but he's also the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means an appeasement of wrath, an appeasement of just, righteous, divine wrath. And so you can see why John uses that word here, because he said that God is faithful to forgive our sins when we confess them, and he's also just to forgive our sins. Well, how can he be just in forgiving our sins? Is he just turning a blind eye to them? Is he just sort of letting it go, passing over it, not worrying about it, dismissing it, saying, well, I'm going to be nice to you today, and I'm going to sort of forget what you've done? No, no, no. He's just. He's a just God. He can't do that. He can't be like a judge who might wake up in the morning one day and decide as he's driving into work, you know what? No matter what crimes are put before me, no matter what people are on trial, I'm just going to dismiss them. That wouldn't be just at all. It might be merciful in a certain kind of way, but it wouldn't be just. No, he says God's just to forgive your sins. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. God's justice is not violated when he forgives you in Christ. In fact, God's justice is satisfied when he forgives you in Christ. He doesn't violate his justice at all in forgiving sinners. This is why the Apostle Paul can say in Romans 3 that based on the propitiating work of Christ, God is demonstrated to be righteous. And what he means by that, he says, is that he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it's because of Jesus Christ, the righteous advocate, chapter 2, verse 1, and Jesus Christ, the propitiation for our sins. So then, what does it look like positively? We can't claim to be without sin. That would actually demonstrate that we don't know God at all. So we confess our sins repeatedly. We repent of our sins. We bring them to the Lord as they're revealed to us. And, and we know that the Lord promises to forgive us through Christ and based judicially upon what Christ has done. And then what do we do after that? How do we move forward in the Christian life. Well, I love this section of 1 John chapter 2, because what John shows us is that walking in the light is not some mystical thing. It's not, it's not something that is uh, sort of just uh, internal to us, that we, we sort of try to gin up some feeling of communion with God. You know, by God's grace, there are moments in our lives as Christians where we do feel, I think, internally a deep closeness with God. But if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that that's not always the experience that you have. And often that experience comes and goes, depending on circumstances. Perhaps you've, you've had times where you feel a, a, an unusual closeness 
an unusual internal fellowship with God. But, but you know, that's not, that's not always the norm. And so what does it mean to walk in the light if it doesn't mean something like that, some, some deep uh, emotional feeling of closeness to God that, as we know, comes and goes? Well, John is very concrete. He's, he's very clear with us in verse 4. If you say you know God, what does it mean to walk in the light? Well, very simply, it's keeping the commands of God. Another way to talk about righteousness, another way to talk about walking in the light, another way to test yourself as to whether or not this is true of you is simply to look at the commands of God and to say, are those the grid through which I view my life? Is that how I'm seeking to live? It's very interesting in the Bible, from the earliest chapters of Scripture, there are these great contrasts set up for us, and these contrasts actually extend throughout all of Scripture. One of the contrasts that we see early in the Scriptures is a contrast which is expressed in the book of Genesis as hearing versus seeing. Let me explain to you what I mean and give you a few examples of it. Remember how the Bible describes the, uh, the first sin in Genesis chapter 3? It talks about Adam and Eve taking of the fruit and eating it. But it doesn't just say that they did that, although, of course, that's the end result. Now, what does it say as, as the serpent comes and tempts Eve? It says, it says that Eve, Eve looked at the fruit, and, and she saw that it was pleasing to the eye and good for food. And she took it and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate as well. It seems that both of them had that same thought process. They looked, they saw, they thought it made sense for them to eat it. They thought it would be good for them to eat it. And so they ate it. The Lord, when he confronts them about it, says, no, what you, what you did there is, is you didn't listen. You, you didn't listen to my voice. Instead, what you did is you, is you looked and you ate. We see this repeated over and over again in the book of Genesis. So a little bit later on, maybe you'll remember Abram is introduced to us. And Abram is there with his nephew Lot. And at a certain point, as they enter the promised land, Abram, Abram and Lot have to separate from one another because their servants are arguing. And there's not enough food and pasture land for all their flocks. And so Abram says this to Lot. He said, Lot, you, you go whichever direction you want, and I'll go the opposite way. So whichever way you go, I'll go the opposite direction. And it says this. It uses the same language that it used with Eve. It says, Lot looked to the plains of the Jordan, and he saw that they were well watered and good for food. And so he went that direction. And where do we see Lot next in the scriptures? Well, we see him in the city of Sodom. The book of Hebrews tells us that Lot was a righteous man. He was tormented by the unrighteousness of that city. But nonetheless, he was there, and his whole family was ripped apart because of it, and the city ultimately was destroyed. And again and again, in the book of Genesis, and in fact, through the whole Pentateuch, the whole first five books of the, of the Bible, we, we have this contrast that's set up between those who make decisions based on what they see and those who are called hearers. Now, now, what does that mean? It's not just about the sight organ versus the, the, the auditory organ. Uh, that's, that's not what the Bible is getting at. The Bible is getting at this, these different ways of approaching life. Uh, do you approach life as one who, who, who makes judgments based on what you think is right for you in that moment? Or, or are you one who bases your thinking and, and, and your mindset and your, and your decisions upon what God has said in His Word? In Genesis, they would say, are you a seer or a hearer? In the New Testament, it says it like this, walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't mean, of course, that we don't go through life with our eyes open. Again, it's not about sight per se in, in a literal sense. It's about how it is that you, you evaluate the various decisions that you have. Think about it when you sin. Think about some sins that you have fallen into. How does that dynamic work in your heart? You may not think it through quite this way. You may not sort of rigidly go through all these steps. But essentially what you do, maybe in a moment, maybe without even thinking, essentially what you do is you, is you say this, I, I think 
based on my evaluation of all the variables here, I think that if I did this, it would be better for me than if I actually obeyed what God had said. So, so I think in this circumstance, it would actually be better for me, I would bless myself more if I, if I told a lie. Even though I know God says, thou shalt, thou shalt not lie. Or I think it would be better for me in this situation to express anger at this person in a vicious way, because that's really what I need to do to gain control here. Although God says the anger of man doesn't accomplish the purposes of God. And so, so th that's what's happening internally. Whatever the sin is, there's this question of, am I going to go based uh, on my read of the circumstances, what I think is best, or am I going to walk by faith? Am I going to actually let the word of God be a hearer? Am I going to be a hearer? Am I going to let the word of God dictate my actions and decisions? And that's what John's getting at here. Do you want to know what it looks like positively to walk in the light? Well, of course, it means you confess your sin. Because the closer you get to God, the more aware you are of your own sinfulness. But, but it also means simply this. Walk according to the commands of God. Are the commands of God the grid through which you seek to view life? When you come to a decision, whether it's a, a momentary relational decision or whether it's a big life decision, when you come to decision points in your life, do you ask yourself the question, what has God said about this? If you're, if you're facing decisions in the context of the church, this should be the most obvious question for us to ask. What, what has God told us to do? Uh, we want to be hearers here. So what has God instructed us? You want to do that in your life and in your family and, and with your money and, and with your time. What, what has God told me the priorities ought to be? And am I going to walk by that? Am I going to walk by the commands of God? Or am I going to walk by what I think moment by moment might be the best thing for me? You see, one of the interesting things about seers in the Pentateuch and about the way in which that motif is introduced to us is, you know, every time someone is said in the, in the text to look at something, to see something, and then they make a decision based on that, they always make the wrong decision. Because, because what, what is the Bible trying to tell us? The Bible is trying to tell us, no, you, you, you don't know naturally what is best for you. You, you. you think you know how to bless yourself, but, but actually God has spoken. And God has spoken in his word. And so John uses two different ways of describing that. He, he talks about keeping his word, verse 5, and, and walking in the same way in which he walked in verse 6. And actually, aren't those two things really synonyms? Because as we sang earlier from Psalm 1, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But what's the alternative to that kind of walking? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, his commands, his teaching, he meditates day and night. John says that's what walking in the light looks like. Your, your life is now oriented differently if you know God. Your life is now oriented not around what you think, but around what he has said. Not around your natural instincts, but around what he teaches you. Not the way I want to walk, walking in the counsel of the ungodly. People tell you all kinds of things, all kinds of ways, all kinds of priorities you need to have. You need to, you need to satisfy yourself in this way or that way. You need to pursue this or that for happiness. No, no, no. And we're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. We're meditating on the word of God day and night. So you need to test yourself, John says. And he has every hope and expectation that if you're a Christian believer, you will say, yes, I am imperfect. I sin frequently. It's, it's grievous to me. And so I, I have to confess to the Lord. And there are things I don't even know about that I, I can't confess to him because I'm so blinded to my own faults. But, but by God's grace, the, the grid of my life is, is really, is really a, a centered around the word of God. So that when I think about my life, when I think about my decisions, when I think about my resources, I think about the commands of God. 
And that's the priority. And I want to walk in the, in the path that he has set out before me. Your word is a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, it's striking how many alternatives there are to this. Even, sadly, within uh, the professing Christian church. Very sadly, one of the most popular books that was found in the Christian book section several years ago was a book in which the author uh, says this. Actually, right at the beginning of the book, she says this. I, I, I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. And then she gives this list of impressions that she received on a given day. But you know, that's not what John does. John doesn't put us on, on that kind of mystical track where I have to wake up in the morning and depending on you know, how good the coffee was, have to figure out what God's saying to me on that day. It's not that at all. We have the Bible. We have God's word. That's how you become a hearer. You become a hearer by following the commands of God. Now let's look down a little later in the chapter to see this second repeat, really, of this same test. I think John's giving you the test two different ways. You know, in education, they talk about different modalities. Some people need to be taught verbally. Some people need to be shown. Some people need to sort of act, to have activities to, to drive home the lessons. Well, there's a sense in which John is doing that here with these tests. He's giving them to us in slightly different ways. Let's look at it from this angle. Now let's look at it from this angle. It's really the same test, but perhaps this will, this will resonate differently with you. And it begins in verse 29 of chapter 2. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Now, here's what John is doing in this test as he unfolds it in chapter 3. He's basing this test now not just on the nature of God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all but in the nature of what God has done for us as his children. What John says essentially here is this, God is light, and therefore there are all these implications for how you live, but, but also if you're a Christian, the Bible says you've been born again. You've been born of God. You remember that conversation in which Jesus introduces this teaching to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus... No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's been born again. And Nicodemus doesn't seem to understand it. He's confused about what Jesus means when he talks about being born again. And Jesus is very clear with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, this isn't even really new teaching. Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Because what Jesus is doing in John chapter 3 is Jesus is drawing upon words that Ezekiel the prophet had spoken hundreds of years before about this new birth. And Jesus says, don't you see, Nicodemus, this new birth of which Ezekiel spoke is, is what we must have, being born again by the Holy Spirit. And see, this is what John's drawing on. Don't you understand that you have been born again? God has given you a new nature by his Holy Spirit. He has given you new birth. He's given you a new identity. You know, perhaps you can think of it this way. Uh, if, if you've ever had the experience of entering a new job, maybe an entirely different job, an entirely different company than the one you used to work for. And this is a, a superficial illustration of something that's much deeper, but you would arrive, I think, at the, at the workplace on the first day, and you try to sort of get your bearings. What am I supposed to be doing in this job? Uh, who am I supposed to answer to? What am I supposed to wear? How am I supposed to act? What, what are the exact responsibilities? How am I going to be evaluated? You know, if you were wise, those are the questions you would ask because you would want to say, look, I'm in a totally new context now. And that totally new context means that there are totally new demands on me. And those totally new demands are what I'm going to be evaluated based upon. I've got to know who to talk to for certain things. And, and John is saying in a much deeper and more profound way, don't you see you have an entirely new identity, an entirely new nature because you've been born of God. Now, because of that, because you're a child of God now, John says... What you have to understand is that, is that 
God is doing a work in us, um, and it's a profound work, and it should have deep consequences. So this is what he says in verses 2 and 3. What we will be as God's children hasn't yet been revealed. We're not there yet. Sort of like what he said back in chapter 1. If you claim to be without sin, you're lying. You, you don't know the first thing about God. You're not close to God at all if you claim to be without sin. And here he's saying, if you're born of God, what you will be in the end hasn't yet been showed us. You're not there yet. But we know that what, what our trajectory is, what we're headed towards, if we're really born again, is, according to verse 2, we, we, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he really is. Now, if that's the trajectory, and if that's the identity that we have, John says, therefore, in verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness, sin is lawlessness, and, and this is incompatible, John will say, with our new nature. So if the first test was grounded or, or shown to us from the angle of the nature of God, this is shown to us from the angle of our, our new identity, our new nature, our being children of God. And see, if you're a child of God, your trajectory is clear. You're going to be like Christ one day when you see him. You'll be like him. You'll see him as he really is. This is, again, almost, almost like God is light. This is one of those truths that I, 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 I can hardly fathom. I, I, can't, I can't actually imagine myself without all the flaws and misperceptions and sins that I, that I possess. I, I really can't. It's, it's just a part of, part of the, the way I think and certainly part of the way I act. And by God's grace, uh, being sanctified. But, but it's hard to imagine yourself apart from living in this fallen world, isn't it? And yet he says that's the trajectory. We're going to be like him, for we'll see him as he really is. Now, if that's true, if we've been given a new nature by Christ, and if we're going to be transformed into his likeness, then that needs to completely change our perspective towards sin, because he says sin is lawlessness. Uh, sin is, is a, a complete disregard for the commands of God. Remember, the commands of God are that which we should be walking in. If we're walking in the light, that's what it means, walking according to God's word. Well, sin is lawlessness. Sin is opposed to all of that. Sin is opposed to any standard at all, actually. Because again, what you do when you sin is you say, it's my standard, it's what I want. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's, that's lawlessness. There, there is a law. There is an actual standard. God has given you his word. And when you sin, what you're, what you're, what you're saying is that standard has no bearing on me. I do, I do what I want because I think it's the right thing to do. You do what's right in your own eyes. Remember how that's repeated over and over again in the book of Judges. There was no king in Israel. They just did what was right in their own eyes. It's just utter lawlessness. That's what sin is. Ah, but, but you see, Jesus Christ has, has done a work in us, so, so we are going to be like him one day. And, and, and therefore, if you're going to be like him one day and you're abiding in him now, then that attitude, that perspective of lawlessness, that perspective of he, he has no bearing on my life, his word has no bearing on my life, I just do what I want when I want to do it, I just, I just go as the wind blows me. No, no, that, that attitude can, can have no part in someone who has been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these are difficult verses. They're difficult verses because if you took them in isolation, and, and, and depending on your translation, too, the translations sort of alter our understanding of this. But, but if you took them in isolation, you might say, well, it almost seems as if John is saying you, you, can't, you can't sin at all if you have any fellowship with Christ. And I think, actually, what John is teaching us, we know that he can't be teaching sinless perfection. He's already told us earlier in the book that if anyone claims they're without sin and therefore have a relationship with Christ, they don't know what they're talking about. They're lying to you. So I don't think that's what he's saying here, but what he's saying here is this. Remember, he's introduced sin as lawlessness. That's how he defines it here. And what he's saying is that, that if your life is lived in such a way so that the law of God, the commands of God, have no bearing on it, 
that the way you live life is, you know, your Bible is on the shelf gathering dust. It, it might as well have never even been given to you by God. If that's, if that's how you see things, you're a law unto yourself. Well, John says that that is incompatible. It's incompatible with saying you have fellowship with God. Now, this, I think, is very helpful as well. Because, as I mentioned before, you will meet many people who say, oh, yes, I love, I love Jesus, I love God. Maybe they, they show up occasionally on Sunday morning. Uh, but, but the real test, John says, is this. If you, if you actually love him, if you actually know him, how, how is your life governed? How is your life lived? Sin is lawlessness. And actually, if you, if you continue to live in that way, according to verse 8, that's of the devil, not of Christ at all. In fact, the reason the Son of God appeared, he says in verse 8, was to destroy the works of the devil. So it's because of the nature of Christ and his work, but it's also because of the nature of what God has done to us in Christ. And I think perhaps the clearest verse to describe this is in verse 9, and I think the imagery here is very helpful. At least it's been very helpful to me in understanding this concept of the new birth. Look at the image John uses in verse 9 of the new birth in chapter 3. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. Now think about that just for a moment. We've all had experience with seeds. Some some of us have had successful gardening experiences. Some of you are like me, and you've had very unsuccessful gardening experiences. But, But you know in principle how it's supposed to work. In principle, how it's supposed to work is a seed is placed in the ground, and it's very small and insignificant, isn't it? But, but under the right conditions, when handled rightly, that seed inevitably produces some significant fruit. And oftentimes, if you go into a place where there are many trees, it's almost hard to imagine the fact that those trees were once small seeds. And now they're powerful, seemingly indestructible. They can be around for hundreds of years. He said, that's the way the new birth works. The new birth is God's seed planted in you. It may seem small, it may seem relatively insignificant, but there will inevitably be change. There will inevitably be fruit. There will inevitably be growth. Remember that image again from Psalm 1. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. God's seed abides in us. So therefore, it then will become evident who the real children of God are and who the real children of the devil are because if God's seed is planted in them, they will obey God's commands. They will not live in a lawless way. They won't live their lives as if God's commands have no bearing on them. And in fact, what they will inevitably be be moving towards in their trajectory, because we know this is where we will end up, is they will be moving towards Christ-likeness. So, again, this is the test we have to give ourselves today. What governs your life? What's the trajectory? Do you actually know this God, the God in whom there is no darkness at all? And have you actually experienced this new birth? in which God's seed is planted in you, drawing you, pulling you, moving you towards the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for this time, for this session. But more importantly, we are grateful for your word, which is so clear in its teaching, so powerful. We thank you for your spirit who works through your word. And we pray that as we process these things and think about them, you might cause them to sink deeply within us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.